Okay, so thank you very much, Peter. Um, and thanks for having me for day two. Wow, I can't believe that so many people showed up again. Thanks. <laughs> um, so now for something completely different. But the theme of today, the take home message for me is redundancy, right? So I came, I had my talk on a little thumb drive. I had my talk up on the Google Drive and I had downloaded my talk onto my iPad and I pulled it up here from the Google Drive. I don't even know where one figure that was in it came from. It was all like skewed and weird. So we pulled it up a second way and that was all bizarre and wrong. And I was like, okay, this isn't so good. So we pulled, so I'm gonna give my talk on my iPad today. So I'm kind of a little bit tethered over here, but it's gonna be awesome and the figures are correct. So, um, sorry about being tethered, but here we go. Um, I wanna talk about disease today. Um, and this is actually, in a kind of weird way related to what I was talking about yesterday in the sense that I'm really interested in consumer resource interactions very, very broadly. And at one point as a early postdoc, I was out in the field during an aphid outbreak in a nutrient experiment. And I was looking at aphids and I was thinking, why, you know, thinking about herbivore plant interactions and nutrients and how they might modify that. And, you know, you kind of stink as an herbivore. Why is everybody all up in there? You know, why do people care about aphids? I mean, that's like me dying of mosquito bites, right? And it was this moment where I'm like, oh, that's why, you know, we care about mosquitoes because of disease, not, I mean, they're annoying. Same thing for aphids. So this is the motivation that really got me into thinking about disease ecology. At the time, I was trained really classically in host parasitoid and quite easy transition to host pathogen theory and thinking about that very tight linkage. And this is what the vast majority of the literature looked like at the time. There's a pathogen and it has a host. There we go. Okay, right? But I'm a community ecologist deeply Right? I'm really interested in all of the other potential interactions out there. And so when I think about disease ecology, even in 2002, I think, what about all the other interactions out there? Right? So we've got pathogens and hosts, but there's all kinds of differences in pathogens and all kinds of differences in the host. There may be consumers of those hosts. There may be differences in the nutritional quality of hosts. Maybe there are different vectors. So walk through how... I think about this as a problem. The first is the host, right? So there may be many different species that are susceptible to the same pathogen, but maybe differently so, right? There may be variation among hosts in their susceptibility. Okay, then let's think about the vectors. Maybe there are multiple vectors that carry the same pathogen species, or maybe those vectors carry different pathogen species but have different preferences among hosts. Maybe they all tend towards certain types of hosts. Yummy, nutritional, high quality hosts from the perspective of the vector. Okay, then let's think about the pathogen, right? There might be multiple strains of a single pathogen. Maybe they interact within a host. Maybe they interact within the vector. Right? There may be species interactions going on here that we're ignoring when we think about just host and pathogen interactions. Okay, let's think about consumers, right? If you think about healthy herds, right? So some predator comes through and it finds all the little slow, sick gazelles and eats them, right? That reduces the pathogen load in that overall host population and maybe in many different types of hosts. Or maybe that uh, that preference is the other direction, right? Maybe that predator avoids sick hosts, right? Sick prey, because maybe it can also become infected by that same pathogen. Then there's consumer, uh, sorry, then there's the nutrition in the environment. So resources may in fact inf affect the pathogen's trajectory, either of arriving in a host, proliferating in that host, or leaving that host. And there's a lot of evidence of that, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But first I want to introduce what I think about when I think about that food web, right? So I showed you in words, now I want to show you what that looks like in my mind and map it back onto some of the literature, right? So 
Maybe when you think about host and pathogen, you think about me, right? You know, my flu or your athlete's foot or whatever it might be, right? So you and your pathogen, right? Maybe you kind of like animals, like caterpillars, of course, because that's the animal that comes to mind, right? I happen to like grasses. So that's my host in this system. What about the vectors? Well, you know, you probably are thinking a dengue virus, right? Something that can be transmitted by a mosquito or a tick, right? Lyme disease. In my system, I think about aphids. They're the analog. They have these little pokey mouth parts, much like a mosquito that pokes into something that is a lot like the blood, the phloem of the plant. And they transmit pathogens in very similar ways. So that's my vector. I think about viruses. There's a wide variety of viruses. So I've started to think more about fungi and bacteria. I'll tell you about that at the very end. Um, but when I think about the viruses, I think about like there's a wide variety of different viruses that may, in fact, infect a host at the same time. They may interact at the scale of a cell or the scale of a tissue. Maybe your predator, you think about lions. I work in the EEB where there is a lion lab at Minnesota. I happen to think about things like grasshoppers. Those are my predators. <laughs> they are the consumers and they are voracious. They eat not only grasses, but duct tape, right? They, are, they will eat anything. You leave bags out in the field. They consume the bags before you put the plant in them. Okay, but what's up with nutrition? Right? So when I think about nutrition, maybe, maybe when you think about nutrition, this is what you see in your mind. Right? Thinking about this vast array of different types of foods and how that may affect your health. All right, so the analog for me, oh, sorry. Uh, I want to just show you that there's actually, I mean, this is one example, but there's actually quite a bit of evidence and growing evidence that malnutrition and not only endemic infections, but you, know, you can have transmission of you know, infectious disease that is modified by nutrition. And so this is one example of malnourishment of children changing immunodeficiency and changing rates of infection. So nutrition can really modify infection in individual hosts, but also transmission of infection. OK, so when I think about nutrition in my system. You may think about all of these vegetables as your nutrition, but those vegetables are my hosts, right? So the nutrition that they are seeking is elemental or are elemental nutrients. So I think about this vast array of different elemental nutrients that make up a plant. And that is nutrition from my perspective. I talked about this yesterday. I'll raise it again today that we are changing the rates of supply of elemental nutrients in locations all around the world through human activities. And this is just projecting forward with a paper from over a decade ago, but a really nice paper by Galloway et al. looking backwards, semi-current and forwards in time in where the rates and locations where uh, elemental nitrogen will be coming into ecosystems. We're seeing something very similar with phosphorus coming into ecosystems. So soil movement, this is actually a picture of soil movement or modeled soil movement um, from one region to another. This up here is a single agricultural field in Brazil that was rainforest and is now a soybean field. So we are making these choices at the field scale but many, many, many times over, and modifying where nutrients are around the world. So they're coming into and leaving ecosystems. So we're changing not only the supply rates, but the ratios at which they're arriving and leaving. Now I want to introduce the system that I'm thinking about. So within plants, why is this a useful study system? Well, first off, they sit still, and that for studying disease ecology is super handy. I can put them out, apply some kind of treatment, and go back and find them all. <laughs> um, it's also a really nice system 
because I can not only plant them out, but I can change how far apart they are and the conditions under which, or the conditions that they're experiencing. I want to think about how infection occurs across very different spatial scales. So within host cells, you could have infection or co-infection where two pathogens may be directly competing for that cell's resources, whether it's ribosomes or elemental nutrients within that host cell, or within tissues, and there can be longer distance transport through that host, through host tissues, maybe from shoots, maybe from leaves, to roots, right? So there can be long distance transport where there may be some segregation or movement through space, thinking about local processes and longer distance processes. That same thing can happen at the scale of host individuals, where there can be within host and among host processes, and across landscapes, where there can be within host population and across space, right? Movement across host populations. So these are kind of analogous processes of local and longer distance uh, that are occurring at many different spatial scales. We have evidence that, there, uh, that disease maps onto these types of spatial scales. So the first one, regional context, so that larger, larger, largest spatial scale that I talked about. Um, we have species ranges that may or may not be overlapping, that may modify what species are coming into contact with one another. Um, for example, for plants, rainfall abundance, actually animals as well, rainfall abundance and uh, seasonal patterns can modify not only the health of hosts, but also the distribution of hosts through space. Um, and again, thinking about plants, the nutrient availability can modify competition among hosts and the coexistence across uh, space. So this is one example of the overlap and movement of the host and pathogen in white nose syndrome, which is uh, devastating bat populations. The host, uh, local context of hosts, you can have the relative abundance of hosts and non-hosts that may modify how much infection or what types of infection are in a population or a community. You can have shared hosts, so one pathogen that shares many hosts. So Lyme disease is a good example of that, one that many people are familiar with, where there are a lot of different wildlife uh, hosts and humans can also get that disease, although we are a really crappy host or kind of a dead end host. So from the perspective of Lyme disease, we kind of suck. Um, but a lot of different uh, animals that we may come into contact can really amplify that disease. Um, and finally, host traits can be really important. So at the scale of individual hosts or among host selection in pathogens, we can have taxonomic distance or phylogenetic distance that can determine the um, palatability or appropriateness of a host for a pathogen, whether that pathogen can even infect that host. Um, growth rate, competitive ability, lifespan, right? Defense, different uh, species have different levels of defense against pathogens. Um, and there are preferences by vectors, right? Those vectors are not thinking, oh, I'm carrying a pathogen, I will choose this host. They're thinking, if I can say what a vector is thinking, um, they are trying to maximize their fecundity. They are moving around an environment and foraging. They are animals. They are not just vectors. And the disease ecology literature often ignores that piece that these are truly animals foraging in an environment. They're not just some mean field distribution, <laughs> a probability. Okay. But what about nutrients? How do these modify and feed back to change infection? They could potentially, I tried to highlight this, nutrient availability, fertility, preferences, growth rate. Right, so you could imagine that nutrients could modify each of these processes. But we also, I like to keep one foot in the world of theory, so my a priori hypotheses. We also have quite a bit of theory that we can bring over into disease ecology. Not traditionally, not originally developed thinking about pathogens, 
but we can sort of generalize because math is awesome, right? And so imagine resource ratio theory, one resource on the x-axis, one resource on the y-axis, and depending on the rates and ratios of supply of those different nutrients, we get different outcomes. And in fact, we can predict co-infection or coexistence of two pathogens in on two shared resources. Oops, I keep trying to click forward here. <laughs> um, at the host scale, we could have pathogen resistance on one axis and host growth rate, so trade-offs. Right? Trade-offs between uh, these different, uh, different host traits from the perspective of the pathogen. So for example, the apparency or allocation trade-offs uh, within the host, but also pathogen traits. Growth rate may trade off with virulence, right? Um, that could allow the coexistence of pathogens with different traits. And among host populations, you might have host population one and host population two. And if, for example, nutrients change the relative abundance of those hosts across a landscape such that there's some sort of a trade-off across that landscape. You could imagine that that might also be a set of processes that would be modifying pathogen infection across that landscape. So you could have amplification, for example. If the species that is better at increasing and transmitting that pathogen also increases in that new environment. Or you could have uh, dilution in the other case, right? So if you have that uh, shift in host types with nutrient addition. Okay, so the system that I'm working in, um, and I have been since about 2003, are the barley and cereal yellow dwarf viruses. So this is a multi-host set of pathogens. Uh, they can infect over 150 different kinds of hosts, so way more than Lyme disease, right? This is an enormous range of hosts. They're all grasses, so they're all in Poaceae. So in one region of the plant phylogeny, but still quite a broad range of annual grasses, perennial grasses, there are crops that are infected. Um, but there's a highly, huge amount of variation. There's a um, high variation in terms of susceptibility, the amount, viremia, the amount of virus that can uh, infect a host, how much, how high that population can grow within a host, and then the symptoms of the host. Some hosts can be infected and not really show any symptoms, and some almost immediately after infection become pretty sick, right? They, their photosynthetic rates decline, their growth rates decline. It's multi-pathogen, so there are actually five different viruses, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They're more and less closely related. There are actually two genera of viruses, if you'll go there with me <laughs> in terms of taxonomy. Um, and importantly, it's only in the vegetative tissue of the plant. This set of viruses cannot and does not infect the seeds, which means that if the host dies, leaving only seeds, the infection will disappear out of that population. But if there's vegetative tissue that remains among seasons, then that pathogen can remain in the system among seasons. So that's this no vertical transmission, and it has to be vectored by an aphid, so much like mosquito-vectored viruses. Um, it reduces survival, growth, and fecundity, and with my training in host parasitoid and the theory around those interactions, when I saw that, I was like, woo, that's interesting because that could modify these trade-offs. That could modify the competition or the outcome of competition between two hosts if they have different effects, right? So putting together this variable susceptibility and viremia uh, and symptoms with this reduction in survival, growth, and fecundity. And what's great about this is it's an economically important grain disease. So people working on crops have done all of the cool microbiology of these viruses so I can start to ask ecological questions. So there's a ton known and a lot of methods are sorted out because people have been doing it in corn and oats and rye and barley. <laughs> and so I can stand on their shoulders and move forward and start to ask about questions 
in non-agricultural settings. All right, so introducing the vectors <laughs> and the viruses. In the middle, I have the viruses. In blue is the BYDV, one genus, and in green are the CYDVs, the serial yellow dwarf viruses. Um, they're, well, as viruses go, they're pretty different from each other, but they're related enough that they're two different genera. I don't really know what to do with that information, except that they're, they're different enough that they have been elevated to uh, two different viral genera. Um, there are several different vectors. I have a handful of them pictured here, but one in particular I want to pull out here because it can vector both a CYDV and a BYDV, and that will become important later. So I will talk about that one. We use that one quite a bit when we're looking at virus-virus uh, virus introductions into a host. Okay, now I want to introduce the hosts. So broadly speaking, we have perennial grasses and annual grasses that are out in the wild. Um, the perennial grasses can live anywhere from five years to 100 years. All right, for those of you that work on trees, just take that, okay? Um, and... <laughs> What they can do is act as this among season reservoir, right? Because they retain their vegetative tissue from one year to the next. Even if they die back to the um, ground and the above ground vegetative tissue is lost, the roots still are retained. Sometimes the above ground vegetation is retained. With the annual grasses, they live for one growing season. They put everything they've got into making seeds. All of the vegetative tissue dies after they dump their seeds. So if there were a system that were entirely annual grasses anywhere ever, <laughs> we could get rid of this virus, but there isn't. So check out your lawn. Um, and so what happens here is they actually often, these annual grasses, have relatively high nutrient content and they can uh, act to increase local infection. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay. Now I want to get into some more nutrient stuff. That's where I get excited. So in general, when we look at the dogma in the literature, aphids that eat phloem, and they actually have these little spiracles back here, they're like getting rid of all that extra carbon and trying to store up the nitrogen, right? That's why they get farmed by ants. Um, they are considered to be nitrogen limited because they are seeking that nitrogen in a super high carbon uh, setting, right, food source. On the other hand, viruses that are really rapidly proliferating, they require a lot of ribosomes in that host, right? So that ribosomes require a lot of phosphorus to make. That rapid proliferation happens because of the phosphorus that goes into making the ribosomes that the host is putting into, investing in that. And we see, or we think, that the viruses are likely to be most limited by phosphorus right? because of that rapid proliferation, that requirement of uh, that phosphorus nutrients for, as a nu nutrient for growth. Okay, so what do we see in the field? This is just stepping back and looking across the whole U.S. West Coast. We sampled a lot of sites, probably 20 sites for this, just ob observing. What do we see in terms of frequency of infection single infection or co-infection. This is permutation test to just ask, you know, if we took these same sets, uh, same data, and we asked, you know, what across the data set, what would we expect? We actually have fewer single infections than we would expect that we observe, and far more co-infections. And in fact, we have about 30% of the plants that we found out in the field, just collected across the U.S. West Coast from British Columbia down to San Diego, have three, four, or five different barley and cereal yellow dwarf viruses in a single individual. So clearly co-infection is not killing you immediately, but we want to understand more about why that is, what's happening here. Okay, so first off, at the very big scale, do nutrients impact this prevalence of viruses in the field. So this is a study that we did with observational data. It was a great road trip with my field technician. <laughs> we drove all over the U.S. West Coast and collected um, 
a few, three different host species at a variety, well, you can see a variety of locations uh, in several states. So across about 15 degrees of latitude at 26 population, sorry, 26 populations at 11 different sites. Um, some of them coastal and running to inland. Um, here's what we found across a gradient, observed gradient of soil nitrate, we saw increased prevalence with increased soil nitrate at sites. Okay, so more infection. And we saw increased, uh, sorry, decreased prevalence with increasing precipitation. So there's less prevalence broadly as we went further north. However, there is also covariation, negative covariation between precipitation and soil phosphorus. So we're stuck with the observational study problem of, well, we have a bunch of covarying factors in the environment. We don't really know what's causing this, but maybe it's nutrients, right? So we decided that we would do a very large scale experiment at these sites on the West Coast. So we chose these sites in part because they break up the north-south rainfall gradient. So we have as much variation in rainfall among these sites as we do north and south. We had set up plots at all of these sites that were 40 meters on a side, which is big for plant ecology. <laughs> um, five sites in Oregon and California, so spread across three here and two here. We had six host species that we arrayed out into the field. So set up two blocks with nitrogen, phosphorus in a factorial combination. And within each of these plots, we ran transects and set down these subquadrats <laughs> that we divided into six. We randomized which species was in which corner, but we had all six species planted out. So planted out healthy into the field and sorry if you're red-green colorblind, we couldn't hire anybody that was red-green colorblind that year because we used little red twist ties <laughs> at the base of little green plants. But what you can see here is actually representative of these plants in the field. They look like all the other plants, at least to us, right? So after a few weeks of growing out in the field, they were difficult to find, but we had set them up so that we could actually go back and find every single one of those individuals and track their infection. So what did we find? So in terms of local context, we found that if there are no perennial grasses in the system at all, so zero on this x-axis of perennial grass cover, we have basically no predictive ability. However, with increasing cover of perennial grasses, right? remember they're the ones that can retain infection among seasons, we have increasing prevalence of infection. Okay. When we look at each of the viruses separately, we found that not all of them were doing the same thing, but broadly, they tended to increase with increasing perennial grass. So they were broadly following that same pattern with each of the viruses, not separating out and doing different things. However, when we added nitrogen and phosphorus, we found that phosphorus addition actually increased total grass biomass. Nitrogen also increased grass biomass, but phosphorus was actually really strongly increased prevalence. So it's phosphorus, which starts to point to maybe something about the virus, All right? That virus doing better for whatever reason, but it's hard to know what part of transmission or proliferation within a host was benefiting here. Now let's look at the separate viruses, right? So we can separate those out and only two virus species responded to phosphorus. So they're doing different things. Even virus species within the same genus apparently are playing a different game. So this is BYDV, one of the BYDVs. This is another one, but a third one, not seeming to really respond, not seeming to really increase with phosphorus, uh, and the only CYDV that we were able to assay for that year uh, seemed to not respond in the field when we added phosphorus. The hosts really differed in terms of which species were infected and had high prevalence of infection. So I have the virus species here 
on the x-axis, and the prevalence of infection, each of these different colored bars represents a different species. So for example, Teniatherum caput medusae, which is uh, medusa head, if you guys are familiar with West Coast grasses, this one always had a high prevalence of infection by every single one of those viruses relative to the prevalence of infection by other viruses. In contrast, Elemis glaucus, which is phylogenetically reasonably related to Teniatherum, always had a lower value, is always less infected, lower prevalence at all sites. All right, but when we looked at aphid preference, so this was a project that one of my honor students had done in the lab. And we looked at aphid preference in pots. Then we mapped on viral prevalence that we observed in the field. And my goodness, <laughs> that really maps on quite well. So what we see here is all across all viruses with increasing preference, we see increasing prevalence in the field. So it does suggest that there's a role of preference by the, the aphids as well. And I'm just adding this in that host traits can also vary, sorry, uh, vector preferences can also vary with the presence or absence of a virus. So this is very new work that a uh, recently uh, employed postdoc, I was gonna say departed, but she isn't departed. <laughs> uh, recently employed postdoc, uh, Lauren Shoemaker did, looking at whether an aphid had a virus in its gut or whether an aphid didn't have a virus in its gut or whether it did have a virus in its gut. And on the y-axis here is the percent of aphids on perennial leaves. So if it's 50-50, that means they didn't have a preference between perennial or annual hosts. And if it's greater than 50-50, there was a preference for perennials. So in fact, when the, vir when the aphids were carrying a virus, that virus seems to have shifted its behavior and its preference in the landscape. It tends to move toward perennial grasses. Okay, so that's a lot of information. And to summarize that, we've got nutrition and host traits and local composition that all across this very large range seem to determine something about infection and co-infection in these hosts. The viruses do seem to modify the behavior and choices of the vectors, so behavioral ecology and vectors not just being some kind of mean field thing. Sorry, if you ever model diseases. <laughs> um, it's important to consider that. They are choosing and moving across a landscape. And one thing that really struck me is these are pretty similar viruses, and they're apparently playing pretty different games. So fairly similar viruses structurally, chemically, <laughs> are doing something pretty different in this environment. Okay, but a field experiment is complicated because when I put nutrients out in the field, I showed you yesterday, I'm, there's a lot of things changing in the field. So for example, this is plant biomass over here, and this is percent nitrogen in the tissues on the right-hand side. On the x-axis is you know, control and with nitrogen. On the y-axis here are the different types of plants, annual grasses, exotic grasses, and native perennial grasses. In fact, when we dump nutrients out into the field, we tend to see more annual grasses. We also tend to see yummier ones from the perspective of an aphid, higher nutrient, more nutritious grasses. And I can't separate those two in the field. So we decided to take it into the lab and try to separate out those pieces. So thinking about environmental nutrient supply, it can modify plant traits, plant chemistry, the relative abundance of different species, which may in fact modify the vector and the vector's behavior and choices in the environment. And it may change virus titer, right? If we have something about the number of viruses that are responding to nutrient availability within host cells, that may also play a role in this, these patterns we're seeing in the field. So this is a former postdoc of mine, Christelle Lacroix, who ran an experiment. This is that aphid that can vector two different viruses that are in different viral genera. 
So she used the same aphid species, so no change in preference there, with two different viruses, a single host species of Venus sativa, which is oats, with a control, elevated nitrogen, elevated phosphorus, and then both. And what she was able to do with this uh, nutrient design was have the low, the control, be stoichiometrically, so in terms of the N to P ratio, it was identical to this high N to P ratio. And the nitrogen here was much higher and phosphorus was much higher relatives, right? So what she was able to do was separate out with this design the rate of supply from the ratio of that nutrient supply to ask whether there's something about the balance of nutrients or the total amount of nutrients that modify what's happening in the system. And so she looked at the uh, effects of transmission success at 19 days post-inoculation. So hosts were inoculated on the same day, either with one or both together. These are a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk through the figure itself. On the x-axis here are single inoculations, the proportion of plants that are infected and detectable at 19 days. On the y-axis are those co-inoculation. I will present PAV as black and RPV, just the two different viruses, black and then unfilled circles here. Below the line, these are, this is the case in which there is suppression by co-infection, right? So there's this proportion of hosts here that are infected. There are fewer hosts that are successfully infected at that same point in time in co-infection, right? The same, or sorry, the opposite is true above the line. So this is the case in which that inoculation success is enhanced there's some sort of facilitation in the presence of the other virus. So starting with the controls, so very low rates of supply of nitrogen and phosphorus, you can see that both are somewhat suppressed in co-infection. Right? There's just not a lot of nutrients to go around. However, this is where it gets a little complicated. <laughs> what you can see here is with nitrogen and phosphorus, Right, so moving from the control and adding elevated rates of nutrients, whatever nutrient you add, PAV is doing better. There are greater inoculation success both in single infection and in co-infection. Nitrogen increases co-inoculation success here for RPV, but phosphorus, wow, it just nails RPV. It declines. It, so that mismatch in phosphorus, right? High rates of phosphorus, low rates of nitrogen. And you see that it just can hardly even infect a host at all, whether or not there's another species, virus species present. This only partially maps onto what we see in the field. So at least for one species, PAV here and here, PAV is increased when we add phosphorus in the field, it's also increased with nitrogen, but more strongly increased with phosphorus in the field. But RPV shows no effect here. RPV is just hammered when phosphorus is added at all. So it doesn't fully map onto what's happening in the field. And we decided that we should try to understand what, what is happening in terms of the time course of infection. Right? So this is Amy Kendig, who's recently graduated from her PhD and is doing a postdoc now. Um, she ran using the identical hosts and conditions as Christelle. She ran an experiment where she then tracked through time the rate of change in the population size of the viruses within a host. And so this is both together and single inoculation. On the left-hand side of both of these is low nutrient status. On the right-hand side is elevated nutrient status. The first thing I see here is left and right look pretty much the same, which says to me the time course of infection is not changed by nutrients. But the other thing that I see is in the presence here in red, in the presence of the other, there is greater 
infection and greater, sorry, greater titer. So a higher population size within the host through time than there is in the absence. Again, pointing to something facilitative, maybe overcoming host defenses. So again, complicated, but this is the lab piece. That nutrient supply seems to control infection and co-infection, which points to maybe some sort of a growth defense trade-off. Co-infection appears to increase titer, so the population size of viruses within a host, which points to some sort of a facilitative process. The nutrients don't appear to affect that time course of infection. But the, again, once again, what you see is PAV and RPV, these two viruses that are reasonably similar to one another, seem to be doing something really different inside of hosts, following different time courses of infection, responding to co-infection differently. So these nutrient impacts can occur at many scales. Trying to sort those apart is complicated, but really interesting because we can use theory to help guide asking these questions and take that theory over from population ecology and ask whether it still holds for viruses. Where does it break? Where is it wrong? Where does it not help us predict? And what can we then add to change it? And so what, we, what our results are suggesting is that there's some form of facilitation and we're digging into that further to try to understand, for example, trade-offs between defense pathways within hosts. Um, there are trade-offs at the host scale. So there's apparently some sort of a resource competition for inoculation, so Christelle's work, suggesting that resources change that rate of inoculation success. There are all kinds of changes that are happening even at the scale of an individual that we are now digging into. When I add nutrients to an individual, it tends to individual plant, like, right? When we fertilize plants, they grow more. <laughs> we, we knew that. But what that means is that that's, all of these processes are happening at the same time. It's very difficult to sort those apart because we can't, it's hard to get below the scale of an individual in this system. But we are starting to dig in further to defense allocation. So allocation to growth versus defense when you get nutrients at low and high rates and ratios. And then these aphids do apparently have pretty strong preferences, and those preferences can change with context. For example, the presence or absence of a virus, or high or low nutrients. The virus species uh, also respond differently when we add nutrients. And again, we want to understand more about that. Chemically, they're almost identical. Like if I were to dissolve them down to nitrogens and phosphoruses and carbons, they look almost the same. <laughs> And so there's something else. How they're using the host machinery is the most likely way that they would differ. And we need to dig into that further. And then at this host, at the landscape scale, we also see compositional changes in hosts that lead to dominance by one type of host, for example, annuals over perennials or vice versa, depending on the nutrient content. Okay, so now, where, where are we going from here? Can we use it to understand nutrient effects on whole microbial communities? So we're starting to dig into this using the nutrient network and asking, you've already seen this, <laughs> using this framework, again, introduced yesterday, but at in about 100 grasslands in 27 countries, we have these two different experiments where we've got uh, multiple nutrients being added and changes in consumers and nutrients across landscapes. I'm not going to dwell on it because I dwelled on it yesterday. Just to remind you what we're collecting, we're looking at the cover of species, the mass of species, soil chemistry, uh, light interception, so different types of resources for the plants as well as for the aphids. But importantly, we've used the nutrient network as a platform to do something totally different to sample the microbes within the hosts, to ask if we can generalize. Can we take any of this understanding, this framework, and think about whole microbial communities? What can we know? 
And so this is uh, work that is led by Candice Lumibau, who is a, a postdoc at a different university at this point, but was in my group for a while, looking across a handful of sites in the US Midwest, 280 hosts, which I will just point out is approximately the size of the entire human microbiome project. So that's our small project. <laughs> um, if you don't know what the human microbiome project is, Google it. Um, so about 3,000 fungal OTUs. So you can broadly maybe allow yourself to call it a species. So fungal species, kind of. Um, and about 14 million reads. So a lot of samples from these different hosts. Um, bacteria, I'm still waiting on the data from bacteria, but it turns out the bacteria and chloroplasts are almost the same because chloroplasts are bacteria. Um, so it's actually pretty hard to work on bacteria inside of plant leaves. Um, so what do we know? What do we know about just even big patterns of infection? So this is a um, variance components analysis where we looked at space, a lot of spatial differences, right? Suggesting that there's probably some form of dispersal limitation, at least at the scale of moving among sites. Sites have pretty different sets of these uh, fungi. But even down to blocks, plots, and individual plants, we're finding very different communities of fungi. Environments, so with fencing, with fertilization, we still see quite a bit of variation, particularly different sites responding to fertilization. So the identity of these fungi change in different ways depending on the site. And Finally, the host community itself. So the total plant richness determines the diversity of num the number of different fungi inside of an individual host. And so just to show you examples of that, for example, here's Minnesota and Kentucky, two of those sites, with control, fencing, nutrients, and nutrients inside of fences, right? Same design that I talked about yesterday. And you can see a really different pattern here of richness of fungi inside of individual leaves compared to Kentucky. And so this is something that we are trying to sort out, and I'll show you how in a moment. On the x-axis here is total plant mass, and on the y-axis is fungal diversity. Each of these dots represents different treatments, but I'm not even showing you what those treatments are because it turns out that they don't matter what we see is this very strong decline in the diversity of fungi inside of individual leaves with increasing mass of plants, which suggests that there may be some process of species that are really dominant moving out into this environment with increasing mass. Finally, <laughs> here's what we're doing across the nutrient network. This is. Um, Sites where we've asked people to collect the dominant grass, actually all of these sites, the dominant grass at that site in each of the treatment plots, and where they were able to grow corn, we sent them genetically identical hosts so that we could remove any variation among hosts and use it as a single species where we could look at the differences between uh, the colonization of corn that was genetically identical across all of these sites and a dominant grass to try to understand what are the filters on that community composition? What leads to the composition? Is it more about host type or the environment that we're modifying across our experiment? Or is it about the abiotic environment, something about precipitation, for example? And we'll be able to um, sort those out better with this data set, which is in the middle of the pipeline. I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm about to get it. <laughs> um, but mapping it back onto these different spatial scales of community assembly and community maintenance to try to understand not only diversity, but also composition of the microbial community within hosts. Where we're going from here, a lot of different projects going on in the lab to try to take this in different directions, understanding um, the invasion of a virus entering an already infected host. So looking at whether the species of viruses can meet the requirements of coexistence. 
um, transmission and virulence with one or two pathogens. We have both modeling and experimental work going on in the lab. Host growth rate, right? So let's try to map on host growth rate and pathogen growth rate. Are they happening at the same rate? Is there something that is predictive about that? For example, ribosomes in a host. Um, and then looking with this enormous amount of data that is waiting in Minnesota for me, <laughs> trying to understand more about patterns of community assembly across global scales um, and local scales for whole microbial communities. And with that, I have a whole lot of collaborators on this project. Um, a lot of postdocs that have worked on the project, a lot of co-PIs on the project, um, and I've gotten some nice funding from uh, NSF and a variety of other sources, and uh, Nutrient Network scientists have also contributed samples for this project. So with that, thank you. Thank you.